Good morning. That video that you just saw is every single child on that video is a foster child of some sort. Uh, that video was actually taken out of Arkansas, which is where uh, we affiliate from, in the sense of what the ministry affiliates from. For those that don't know, the Assemblies of God actually has their own foster home. Uh, it's actually called now Compact Family Services, is what we call our Highlands Children Home. And they are trying to branch out. And uh, they're using the model of Complicare that I'm going to share with you on how that's going to happen here in the state of Mississippi. But I'm going to introduce myself real quick. My name is Lee Watson. I uh, hate that my family cannot be here, but they are up on the screen for you to see. Uh, they are all sick right now, uh, and I'll try to go the best I can to introduce you. Um, that is my wife that I'm sitting behind. That's Gretchen. My oldest one standing up in the back. That's Levi. My second oldest is Garrett. Those are our two biologicals. And then we have our three adopted children. Uh, Mackenzie's in the yellow. Wade is actually uh, the, the baby sitting in the lap. And then there's Abby, our free-spirited little daughter. Uh, God has put us on a journey that I never imagined would put me on a stage like I am on this morning. This stage right here prepared me for ministry, for those that don't know. I was raised uh, not necessarily in this church but I was raised to do ministry inside this church through a program called Fun Arts. There's many times I stood up on this pulpit, I preached a five-minute sermon, I sang. In fact, Miss uh, Gayla Burt taught me how to sing. And I have a lot of history in this church. And it's neat on how our journey started us at one point, and now I can stay, still use this same stage to share with you what we're doing right now. Uh, give you a little testimony and background of our family. My two biologicals are a miracle that they're with us today. My oldest one, when he was four years old, we discovered that he had a brain tumor 2.5 centimeters long behind his left eye. Uh, we had a CT scan to prove that it was there. An MRI proved it as well. Uh, three months later, they would take a full body MRI to see if there's any other masses anywhere else on his body. What do you do when you begin... To know that what you're going through, you cannot, you cannot handle it on your own. We pray. That's right. And we begin to pray. We begin to seek God because the next test was going to be in three months. Three months came extremely slow. But the next test would take eight hours to do, but 30 minutes to get the results. And after the eight hours was done, the 30 minutes was up, they came back with a test result. And just to let you all know, that God took care of it and completely took that massive wife out of his brain. That's God. <clears throat> My second oldest son, Lord, you're speaking to us. Amen. My second oldest son, whenever he was born, he was born with undeveloped lungs. And it was uh, a very serious situation. In fact, the doctor, whenever he was born, he came in and he told us, he said, there's nothing that we can really do. If he lives, he, if he lives, he dies, he dies. We tried to get him into another hospital. He said he wouldn't survive the trip. So again, what do we do when we're facing a circumstance that we cannot take care of? We pray, right, church? We begin to pray. We get a phone call on a Sunday night that he miraculously coughed up his tubes out of his throat while in the NICU. He started breathing on his own. Four days later, we bring him home perfectly fine. Amen. So this is where I'm getting to this point. This is where I'm getting. We're sitting in front of my, my wife's do uh, doctor. She looks at us and she says, it's probably out of your best interest never to have children again. And honestly, we were okay with that. We had gone through a few years of just complete turmoil in our life, a lot of faith praying, a lot of believing, and in fact, we took a vacation just to celebrate the fact that I, we had two healthy sons, just thankful. We were content. We were happy. I was pastoring. I pastored about 15 years in the state of Mississippi, uh, completely just, uh, you know, just happy that, life, that we had the life that we had. And don't you know that when you get content, God gets you out of your box, Amen. Because by the time we came back from the vacation, God gave us this crazy idea that we needed to adopt. So we come in uh, back home. I call every single private adoption agency 
in the state of Mississippi, and every single one of them closes their doors in our faces because we had two children, and rightfully so. We understood that. We knew we heard God. We knew that God was leading us to do something more than what we are currently doing and ended up that God opened the doors for us to go into foster care. We spent nine years of our life in foster care. We knew that God one day was going to send some children along that we could actually adopt. Wouldn't happen for six years. It took us six years to finally have a child come into our home that was actually adoptable. And in fact, it was a sibling group. The three that you see uh, up front in that picture are the ones that we were able to adopt out of foster care. I remember the phone call was in October of 2015. We uh, got the phone call from our social worker and said, we have an emergency situation. The situation is, is that we have discovered that these children have been neglected in a previous foster home. We have to get them out immediately. Within the next 24 to 48 hours, we have called three different counties, every single foster home that we knew was open. No, everybody has said no. Will you say yes? And I said over that phone, I said, let me pray about it. Let me talk to my wife, and we'll get back with you. I get off the phone, go talk to my wife about it. We pray for about 15 minutes. I call her back up and say, we'll take the kids. On a Monday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, two social workers knock at our door, and these three children are standing behind it. For us, this has been a six-year journey. For us, this has been a moment because we finally had children that possibly would be adoptable in our home. We were excited. We didn't care how many kids it was. We were just excited that we finally are fulfilling what God has called us to do. So for us in this moment, it was a Hallmark movie moment. Who likes Hallmark in there? Will you raise your hands if you dare? I just, because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to put my hand down because I'm not. Because every single movie has a perfect ending, amen? And in my mind and in my wife's mind, we thought that this was going to be a perfect ending. So even though Wade was eight months, even though Abby was two months, even though Mackenzie was four years old, we expected to open up our doors and for these children to run into our arms and just thank us for taking them in when no one else would. Can I tell you this morning that my, I finally found the Hallmark movie that ended badly because it was my life, amen? Because that little girl in the yellow right there, she wasn't having it. In fact, just to give you some statistics right now about the foster care system of Mississippi, over 8,000 children come in and out of the foster care system every single year. There's only 2,400 homes available for over 8,000 children. That means there's a shortage. And whenever there's a shortage of a problem that we have, there's only two places that children can go. One, that child may go into what we call kinship care. Kinship care is actually where a relative takes care of that child. We have over 40,000 children in kinship care today. 60% of, uh, of those children are being taken care of by grandparents. Grandparents that are 70 years and older. If they cannot find themselves going into kinship care, what we discovered in 2016, we had over 200 children disappear in human trafficking in the state of Mississippi through foster care. In fact, if you know Jody Dias and you know his ministry and what he does, he works uh, uh, single-handedly with human trafficking. He, he actually told me just a few uh, months back that around 60% of all the children that they rescue are foster kids. Because we have an issue within our society, and it's this fact that people like Mackenzie, whenever she came into our home, we were her fourth foster home in a year period. In fact, a child above the age of two in the state of Mississippi in foster care, they will move four times a year. Let me tell you a little bit about Mackenzie. Mackenzie was discovered at the age of two, and no one knew she existed. Her mother was a drug addict. Her dad was a drug addict. They didn't even register her whenever she was born. They had no idea that she, the state had no idea she even existed. And so one day, there was a domestic dispute in the home and police officers came in, and they discovered Mackenzie in a room that they dubbed the trash room. 
See, the trash room was a place because they didn't pay for trash. They just took their trash and they threw it in a room. So whenever her mother was working and she worked to prostitute her body for drugs, she'd take Mackenzie and put her into that trash room where they should stay all day long. Police found her. They found her. They put her into social services, um, into their care, where she would go from foster home to foster home to foster home to foster home. And it was actually in foster, the, the last previous foster home that, they, that she was in before she came over to our home was that that home sexually abused her, physically abused her, and neglected her. If I could tell you the stories, if I had the time to tell you the stories, we would all be in tears in this place because that little girl has gone through more in life than some of us in this place will ever have in a lifetime. So whenever she came into our home, she wasn't interested in having a family. She wasn't interested in another adult. She wasn't interested in another person. She was just waiting to see how long are you going to handle me before you either, one, give me up or you hurt me. And she showed it in her actions. She was angry. She was bitter. She was, uh, she was mad. She was angry at the world because this little four-year-old girl she never had to endure what she had experienced all the way up until this point in her life. That same day, we went back and we prayed with her in her bedroom. And I'm going to be honest with you, um, we try to pray with our children every night. We still try to have that habit. Sometimes that prayer is more for the adult than it is for the child. Sometimes, like when they're sick like they are now, you know, we're praying. When we go in there, we pray, Lord, let them sleep through the whole night so we can get some sleep, you know? And we go back there and we start praying with her. And in the middle of our prayer, she looks up at us and she screams in our face, I don't want your Jesus. I was raised in church my whole entire life. Some of you, you know who my parents are. I was raised my whole entire life in church. And for a man who has been raised in church his whole entire life, that really worked on me. How can a four-year-old reject Jesus? This is what I learned through a process of time, that the word love for her was not something you say. Because every time someone said, I love you to her, that always meant pain would be involved in that word love. So when we say things to her like Jesus loves you, she didn't know Jesus. All she knew about Jesus is that that sounds like another person that can hurt me because they're using the word love. She had no idea. I'm going to get back to her story in just a minute. And through this process of events is what brought us to where we are today. Because we saw a need and we didn't know how to minister to that need until God began to open the doors. And that's how we became what we call Compacare representatives in the state of Mississippi. What we pushed towards and what we uh, tried to uh, help the church understand is that when children come into a home... It's one thing. We need that. When foster children come into their home, that's one thing. But what the foster parents endure while taking care of that child, there has to be something there for that foster parent. And a lot of times our ministry outlook of life is that we look at the child and we go, that child needs us. That child needs help. And sometimes we forget about the parents that are taking care of that child. And whenever I begin to see those statistics that say that a child above the age of two moves four times a year and different things of that nature, what it begins to show to me is that the number one reason why foster parents decide to close their doors and send the, the child back into social services is because they get discouraged, they get upset, and they don't know how to handle the situation while that child is literally jerking doors off of hinges. Because that's what my daughter did. Or the, uh, through the night, we're from 1 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the morning. She'd scream to the top of her lungs because of the flashbacks and the emotional outsets that was having in her life. There was many times in my life that I was ready to say, you know what, honey? We can call that social worker and all of this can be over. All of it's done. And we can go back to our four no more. But the Holy Spirit would always stop us from dialing that number. Every single night we would lay down and go to sleep because God had a greater purpose. And we had a family that would wrap around us and that would love us, that would encourage us, 
that would tell us to keep going, that would get groceries when we couldn't, that would take the kids to doctor's appointments when we couldn't do anything. In fact, one of the, uh, the best dates that we ever had in our life to this day was a two-hour drive around a block, believe it or not. Our kids were sick. We just finished stre- having strep and a stomach bug that went through the house. That's glorious with seven people. And then now the kids were starting to show signs of the flu, praise the Lord, you know. And so out of nowhere, my mom, she drives two and a half hours away. And she knocks on my door. She hands me the keys to her car, and she says, I don't care what you do for the next two hours. You and your wife need to leave and just go do something for two hours. I have the kids. We didn't expect it. We didn't didn't know that she was even coming. And all we could think of, because we were so tired mentally, was to drive around the block for two hours, turn the AC on because our AC was broken our car, and listen to the radio. That's all we did. One of the best dates of our life because at the moment that we needed it, someone showed up to give the encouragement needed. And that's what we are as CompuCare representatives is is we're showing the church how to be compassionate to the foster family because they need it. In fact, we just came across some, uh, some data just this last week, and I've been trying to get clearance if I could share it or not. And they, actually, yesterday, they gave me the clearance to share it. For every foster family that is trained and brought up in their first year, 50% of them closes their doors in the state of Mississippi. 50% of all new foster homes shut their doors in the state of Mississippi. And the reason why that is, is because there's no one there to say you can do it. And in Compacare, that's what we focus on. We focus on encouraging the church to foster, families to foster. We give you the right uh, direction to go and and making sure that, that you get into the right direction through the state to do that. We also teach uh, leaders and volunteers in the church how to do so by wrapping around foster families. We teach the church. We do it all. We take the, uh, the pressure off the pastor's shoulders because I know uh, Brother Brian enough to know that he is a busy man in this church. And we come into the church, and like a missionary that I believe as a missionary does, is they come in, they set the church up, they set the ministries up, they train the people to do it, and even while they're going on to the next church, they stay in contact with the people in this church to see how things are going. That's what we do, and we teach you and show you how to be compassionate to these foster families and the directions and the areas that they need so that they can t- continue to take care of that child. In fact, CompuCare has been around for 10 years now. Over 2,000 children in the state of Florida alone uh, where this ministry has been very steadily involved in the foster care system, they have a 95% success rate of keeping one child and one foster home for its period in foster care, 95%. And why is this? Because the church got involved. And what we've noticed is whenever you put God into the equation of everything in life, things begin to change. Would you say amen? Amen. And as your pastor indicated, James 1.27 is one of the golden rules of the church. The book of James is a book full of things that that is directed towards the church. And so we have that scripture of James 1.27. It says that there's no greater form of religion than one that takes care of orphans and widows in their distress. We understand it. It's, It's a charge to the church to do it. But this is something that I've also learned about that. And that's the important of why you see up on the screen that my sermon is called The Compassionate Church. Because in order for us to have James 1.27, we actually have to have Galatians 6.2. Galatians 6.2 is a very simple passage of Scripture, just like James 1.27 is. And Galatians 6.2 tells us this, that to share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Do you know what the law of Christ is? Two commandments, to love God and to love people. So when we generally love people, we're going to be compassionate towards them to carry the burden that they bring whenever they're facing something in their life. 
Just like out the outside of the four walls of this church are people walking these roads that have burdens on their life. That it requires people inside the church to carry the burden for them. So we can't have James 1.27 without Galatians 6.2. Why? Because we have to have people in the church willing to carry the burden. And so and what we're doing is that's what we're simply teaching the church. is to once again, learn how to carry the burden. And this church does an amazing job. The pastor was telling me about the ministries and the things that this church is doing. And it blows me away because you are not the average church. Because right now, the average church of what we see is we're taking care of more of the burdens inside the church than we are on the outside of the church. And in fact, if you want me to be real with you this morning, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but you want to know why the foster care system of the state of Mississippi is so bad right now? It's because the church has waited too long for the government to fix something that it was never intended to fix, ever. It was the church's responsibility. And any type of humanitarian crisis that we have in our state alone, it requires the church to become involved somehow, some way. Because again, when we put God into the equation, things change. So if you remember in the book of Exodus, and this is my main passage of scripture this morning, in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, we have a wonderful story. I love the Old Testament. My mother engraved the Old Testament in me because her firm belief was that if you want to know who Jesus is in the New Testament, you better understand the Old Testament first. And so I love the story of the early days of the Israelites. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, this is the beginning stages of a young nation called Israel. They had just left Egypt. It had not been that long. They had just watched God do a miraculous work and setting them free from that slavery that they were under during the Egyptian empire. And and they had just watched water come out of a rock. It's unreal. They wake up every morning. They see manna on the floor. They're making bread every single day. Everything has been provided for them. Everything is being taken care of for them. And now they're about to face their first real battle. To a group of key people called the Amalekites. The Amalekites had been around for centuries. They knew the art of war. They understood what it takes to win a battle. And here you have an older Joshua, but he's younger as a general, and he's looking at his situation, and he's looking at what's going on, and he comes running to Moses, and he actually says, look, Moses, we got to come up with a battle plan, because if we don't, we're about to be wiped off the face of the earth. So as we know, good old Moses to be, he just kind of, his ways are not necessarily the ways I would have chosen, but, you know, it was just Moses' ways of doing things. And he looks up on a hill, and he says, look, he said, while y'all are in battle, I'm going to go up on top of this hill. And I'm going to hold this stick in my hand. And while it's up in the air, it's going to give y'all encouragement, what y'all need to win the battle. And so sure enough, Moses goes up on top of the hill, and this is where we start at verse 8. It says, while the people of Israel were still at Rephthan, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek, Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. And as long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hands, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired, he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands, so his hands held steady until a sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. It's a great passage of Scripture. When I'm looking at this passage of Scripture and I'm thinking about it and and I was studying over it, God revealed something to me, and it could have been God or just something I ate. I don't know, but I'm going to say it's God, and we'll go with that. But I'm looking at this story, and here you have an older Moses that he's standing up on top of this hill, He has the staff of God in his hands. This staff 
God has used it to do a lot up to this point. He parted the Red Sea with this stick. This is, a, this is something else when you think about it. So here he is on top of this hill. He's holding this staff up in his hands. And I don't know about you, but I guess I'll be the first to admit it in this place this morning. Whenever I'm worshiping the Lord and I'm raising my hands, and worship was fantastic this morning, amen? But while I'm worshiping in the atmosphere of worship like that, my hands still get tired. And there are times that I have to put my arms down, let the blood circulate back through them, and then raise my hands up again. I just admitted something that we all afraid to admit in the Pentecostal church, amen? And that's what Moses' problem was. He's raising his hands up in the air. They're getting tired. They're getting weary. He puts them down. And every time he puts them up and puts them down, the war is raging down in the valley. And one moment Israel's winning. The next moment they're losing. The next moment they're winning. Aaron and Hur sees this. These two men that sees this burden that Moses is carrying. And they run up on top of that hill. They put a rock up underneath him. He sits down, and they carry out his burden with him for the rest of the war. And the Bible says, because of that, they win the war. Now, this is what God showed me. Is it possible that if it wasn't for two men willing to have compassion on Moses, that we would have the nation of Israel today? Think about it. If it wasn't for those two men willing to carry that burden along with Moses and go up there and see what's going on in the circumstance and being willing to carry that cross for him as well, would it not be possible that today we would not have the nation of Israel if it wasn't for those two men? And this is where I'm going with this church. Listen to me very carefully. Burdens have to have somebody alongside of you to help you carry them. The book of Ecclesiastes even tells us in chapter 4, verse 9, it tells us that there, in your life, there are two are always better than one. And it goes on to say in verse 10, pity is the one who falls and has no one there to pick them up. The word of God is full of scriptures like that because we understand that when God created us, he created us also to have people alongside of us. That's why we love the church so much is because whenever we're suffering, the church suffers. Whenever we're hurting, the church hurts. Whenever we need someone to love us, there's somebody in an altar somewhere that is willing to pray with us and hug us and tell us that everything's going to be okay. That's what the church was designed to do. And it requires us to pick up that burden. Let me fast forward two years. My, um, my daughter is now six. She's now eight, by the way. She's eight years old now. But at this time of her life, she's six. She had a horrible flashback day. And, and like I said, when flashbacks come, the anger, the resentment, everything builds back up. See, for some, some part of her life, during the summer months, one of the families that she would stay with, they would lock her outside all night long in the summer heat. And she'd beat on the door all night long, screaming to let me in. Form of a punishment, they'd put her into a bathtub, strip her naked, and take a five-gallon bucket of ice water and just pour it over and leave her there. So when these flashbacks are coming and coming, that anger in her is building and building. I watched this little girl one time get so upset, she takes her hand and she hits a door and puts a hole in the door at the age of four. She's now six. Bad day. Me and mommy had had enough of it. It's about seven o'clock and we're like, sweetheart, you're going to bed. We can't handle anymore. And it's the first time in two years that we had had her at that point that we saw big gator tears coming down her eyes. We have never seen her cry. And she finally looks at us and she says, I want your Jesus. And this is why. It wasn't anything that we were doing per se. But because we had a family wrapping around us and encouraging us, it gave us the strength that we needed to show her what Jesus looks like. 
to show her what it means to be loved, to show her what it means to know the love of Christ, that Jesus isn't some father or man or person out there that is designed to hurt her, but instead it's there to take her burden and her pain and her suffering that she's experiencing in her life. It's one of the greatest days of my, moment, of my life. When I came into this place, I'm going to close with this. And as I'm closing, just so everybody knows, in case we get caught up in other things, that out in the foyer we have a table, pamphlets, everything you need to know about foster care. But I'm here this morning to share this story with you. I wasn't going to, but actually on the way from Terry to here, God says, share the story. Because some of you in this place, you carry burdens. But can I tell you, church, a lot like my daughter, they're never meant for you to carry. You go home, and because of that burden, that burden is tearing up your life, tearing up your marriage, tearing up your relationships, because it's consuming you. And a lot of times what we are as Americans is we try to fix the burden first and then pray whenever nothing else works, when it should just be the opposite. We should pray first. And let our heavenly father deal with the burden. That's what the word of God tells us to do. My grandmother, when she was living, she came to this church for a while. She shared a story that I forgot about that my mom reminded me of. When my mother was 10, she was the oldest of four. She lived not too far away from this church in Jackson, Mississippi. And... It was about lunchtime, I believe, on a Thursday, if I've got the story right. Everybody was at home. Things began to get really dark outside. In fact, if you look up the history of Jackson, the city of Jackson, you will find this storm that hit the city of Jackson. My grandmother, noticing that a storm is brewing of some sort, she decides to step out onto the front porch to see what's going on. She looks down the road, and she sees a tornado coming her way. My, my grandmother looks back at my mom, who, like I said, was at the age of 10. She looks back at her, and she says, sweetheart, begin to pray. There's only about 20 seconds here. So her and her, uh, her three other brothers and sisters get down on their knees. They begin to pray. There's no time to go to the hall, uh, into the hall or to the cellar or to the bathroom. It was here and now. Start praying. My grandmother was two, pe pe two different people or... She had two, I guess, good traits. Let me rephrase that. One, she was a great woman of God. The second thing is she was extremely stubborn. And I guess she figured that if this tornado is going to hit their house, she's just going to stand and watch it happen because she stood on that front porch and she watched that tornado get closer and closer to the house. And she began to pray, Father, let it dissolve before it hits my neighbor's home. Now, again, this is a, within a 20-second period. didn't take long. But, you know, when moments like this happen, time slows down. She's praying, and she's praying, and she's praying. And she told us, she was like, it was just like something on the back of me began to blow the opposite direction. And that wind got stronger, and it got stronger, and it got stronger. And before you know it, that tornado had dissolved before it ever hit that neighbor's home. And whenever my mother reminded me of this story, I shared in select places across the state of Mississippi, but I felt like I needed to share it here. What God showed me is simply this, and listen very carefully. Some of you are carrying burdens that are just like that tornado. It's twirling inside. It's messing up everything in life. Because that not everything is in line in your life, therefore everything's not right. And, and we're carrying that burden when God said, you're never intended to carry it. In fact, the Bible says, if you come and bring your burden to him, he'll give you one that's much lighter. In fact, the word of God says that he is so good that he gives you a peace that passes all understanding. That's the God that I serve. Is that not a good God? Amen? 
And there's no reason why we as children of God should be carrying burdens that we were never meant to carry when we have a heavenly father who absolutely loves us to death and says, I will take care of it if you actually just give it over to me. But some of us in this place, we have a hard time letting go. Church, it's time to let go. Don't let it tear you up. Can I get somebody to play a song or, or just some background music of some sort? Thank you. I don't want to leave this place this morning. I might be a missionary, but I have a pastor's heart. I don't want to leave this place this morning without giving you an opportunity to release some burdens in your life. So that you can walk out of this place with a peace that passes all understanding. With a peace that when people look at you and they see what you're going through in life, they're going, how can you walk with a smile? And you can say, my father's given me a peace that passes all understanding because I serve a good God. And that's simply what I'm asking you in this place. Are you tired of carrying that burden? I remember when my daughter at the age of six, we knelt beside of a bed And she poured her little heart out to Jesus at the age of six. It wasn't perfect. It was all over the place. But God understood what she was getting at. And she was saying, God, I'm tired of the burden I'm carrying. I'm tired of my pain. I'm tired of my agony. I'm ready to be normal. That's what she said. She knelt on that bed and she just looked at Jesus in prayer and she said, I just want to be normal. And the moment that she began to accept Jesus into her heart, things changed in her life. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect today. But guess what? It gets better. Because she realizes that she has a father who loves her. One that will never abandon her ever again in her life. One that loves her to the place of death. Because that's who Jesus is. With every eye closed and every head bowed across this place. Come in this place and you say, Brother Lee, I've got some burdens. Ready to release them. At the count of three, what I'm going to ask you to do is find you a place in these altars. And there's some good people in this place that I have watched. When you come to the altar, someone's right behind you ready to pray with you. There's going to be some people, man, they're going to pray with you. I'm going to come by and pray with you as well. And we're going to release that burden in prayer to the Lord this morning. So when you walk out of this place and you go eat lunch, you have a peace that passes all understanding in your life. The count of three. One, two, three. Come on. You say, I'm ready to get rid of my burdens. Hallelujah. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Father, move on these, Lord. That in the moments of our burdens and desperations, we realize that we need you more than ever before. Come on. Not everybody is in these altars yet. Someone else, come on. Man, you're tired of it. Hallelujah. Father, I pray right now across this congregation, Lord, that by your power we release that burden in the name of Jesus. That through your authority, Father, that we release that burden in the name of Jesus through prayer. Begin to work, Father, in these people. Work in their situations. Let them know that you're a God who loves them. In the name of Jesus.